we're turning a corner now. Uh, we're turning a corner into what we would call the tribulation period, and it's beginning in Revelation chapter 4. You know, guys, we're living in a time uh, where people are fascinated with the supernatural. Matter of fact, the new buzzword is spiritual. People are no longer religious, they're spiritual. And you hear that again and again and again, that we're spiritual, we're spiritual. Uh, they don't identify with a, a denomination. They don't identify with a sect such as Christianity or something like that. They have created this nebulous called spiritual. And that is what a majority of people are running to this day. Matter of fact, it's even infiltrated the church where the church is also fascinated specifically with heaven. Some of the best sellers over the past few years have been stories of people who have died and returned and they claim to have visited heaven. Uh, it's been so prevalent that some of the false teachers that you see on TV have started latching onto that and telling stories about how they got to go to heaven just like John and like Paul did. I, I listened to one who made this claim and I listened to his story. It started with a complaint to God that he had two or three friends that got to go visit heaven, and he didn't. As if God is somehow obligated to show us something, then he was immediately taken up into heaven, and he began to tour heaven. Sounded a lot like John's description we see in chapter 4, until he gets to the angel, and he begins to look around, and he asks the angel, he goes, I don't see the Holy Spirit. Where is the Holy Spirit? He's not here. He goes, I began to get troubled. Why wasn't the Holy Spirit in heaven? The angel kind of looked at him with a dumb expression and said, well, of course he's not here. He's on earth. Got a problem. John says the Holy Spirit's in the very beginning of the throne, around the throne. He's the seven spirits of God. Secondly, he's a, he's a member of the Trinity, of the Godhead. He's omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at once. He can be both on the earth and he can be both on heaven at the same time. There's nowhere where he is not. Immediately, because he said that, we know what he's saying is a lie, violates Scripture. You know what I've noticed? That in the New Testament, there are two men, two men who are given this privilege, Paul and John. Now, when Paul was shown the same thing John was, he was clearly instructed to not say anything about it or write anything about it. It was for him and God alone. But when John was revealed this, John was given explicit instructions. Remember what they were? They came out of Revelation 1.19. Write the things you have seen, the things which are, and the things that soon will take place. Now we've already started covering this. Revelation 1 was what? The things which are. Revelation 2 and 3 are the things that are, let me make sure I say it correctly. The things which you have, the things which are, are no wait a minute. I've got that completely backwards. Let's back up a minute. Chapter 1 is the things which you have seen. Things which you have seen. What do you see? The risen Lord. Chapter 2 and 3, the things which are. And he's talking to the churches. Now when we get to chapter 4, it's the things that will soon take place. That is everything that is coming after that. John is commanded to write. So let's see what John started writing about in Revelation 4. Verse 1, let's look at what he says. After this, I, this I looked... And there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me sounded like a trumpet. And it said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones. Seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God, which are, is a picture of the perfection of the Holy Spirit. We've already covered that in studying the churches that came into that. Now, I want you to see something. There's a very important phrase that I want you to underline in your notes or in your Bible. Go back to verse 1. After this, some of your Bibles will say, after these things. I want you to underline or circle that. Here's why. It is an extremely important phrase in Revelation because it's introducing a new scene, a new topic, an important transition. 
always, we're going to see it five times. This is the first of the five. After these things. Now, if you hold to a pre-tribulation theology, meaning you believe that the rapture is happening before the tribulation, this is a very key, key turning point for you in your belief. Remember what I told you. We're not here to learn from a perspective. We're not coming from the perspective of being pre-millennial or pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, amillennial. We're not doing any of that. We're focusing on Christ because that's what revelation is. It's the revelation of Christ. Remember what I told you. You do not have to worry about when, when you focus on him. That's our goal here. But if you're going to hold to one of these positions, you have to know what you believe and why. I want you to be able to defend it. But I also want you to recognize, I may be wrong. It may not happen the way I think it's going to happen. It could happen this way. Here's what we know. Christ is returning. We don't know when. We just need to be alert of the signs. I don't want you sold out to a position, and when that doesn't happen the way we think it should, that you become discouraged because it wasn't interpreted exactly correctly. Because a lot of this, we don't know. And I'm okay with that. You need to be okay with that too. We know that in chapter 1, what happened? The risen Lord is presented. But in chapter 2 and 3, a lot of people hold that to be the church age. Now that is the time of what? From the resurrection of Christ and the birth of the church in Acts 2 to the rapture of the church, at, many believe at this point. And chapter 2 and 3 is the church age. Now we know in chapter 3.10, what did we learn? Christ promised that we as his children would not go through the wrath that is to come. Now we've looked at that several different, play, different ways. We're going to look at it continually as we go through this, the rest of the book. But we know that there's a promise there. So, a lot of people who hold to this belief, when they see the phrase, after this or after these things, they believe that this is the point of rapture, where the church is taken to heaven. Matter of fact, as they hear the description of what's happening with John in in chapter 1, or verse 1, before me was a door standing open in heaven, and a voice like one, like a trumpet, they see that as the rapture. That this is Christ appearing, there's a trumpet, and we're taken up into heaven. Now, here's where I disagree, and I want you to think about this. One of the defenses is simply this. After chapter 3, we never see the church in the book of Revelation mentioned again. On earth, on earth. Now, let me clarify that. They're right. The word church is never used again throughout Revelation to describe what's happening on earth. The church is in heaven, we see that. But the concept is, is that the church is no longer on the earth. But we need to ask ourselves, what is the church? What is the church? Well, if you've been in Eagle Heights long enough, when I ask what the church is, many of you will say, I am the church. Well, that's right. If you're a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ, and you put your faith in him, you became part of his body, which is the church. To be part of the church is not to join a church, not to attend a church. It's to be in the body of Christ, meaning I've put my faith in Him, and I am connected to every other believer in the world through the Holy Spirit joining us together. That's the church. Now, where we don't see the name church, we do see the body on earth. Because we see people getting saved throughout the tribulation. So what's the distinction? Well, if, you're in the, if you believe in the church age, which I do, and there's a time before the rapture, we're living under the mercy of God. Grace is freely dispensed. We are free to worship. We are free to accept. It, the, the, the grace and mercy we receive in this moment is unprecedented in history. Now, I know there's persecution around the world, and we're seeing more and more persecution increasing, which Revelation describes. But for the most part, this is an age of mercy. Once we cross over into tribulation, we're no longer under the age of mercy. We're now under the age of justice. To accept Christ in the tribulation means you're most likely going to face persecution, most likely death. Your faith is going to cost you everything at that point. Where on this side, our faith is offered and everything is laid at his feet. And this side, it is taken. Do you see the difference? But we do see the body of Christ on earth. There is a distinction, but it's there. I do not believe, however, that the door being opened is actually the revelation. I have no problem with it being a picture of revelation or of rapture. I don't believe that this is the rapture. 
because we don't know when or where. Christ is clear. We don't know the day or the hour. And the reason I don't believe that is because what is described after is about revelation of Jesus Christ and the Father, not the glorification of the church. It's about revelation, not glorification. That's why I don't believe that this is a point of rapture. I have no problem with it being a picture of rapture, an allusion to something that's coming later, but I don't believe it is happening right here because we don't know the day or the hour. If we knew the day or the hour, we could say, right, this is when it's happening right at this point. Could it happen at this point? Absolutely. But we don't focus on when, we focus on Him. Say that with me. We don't focus on when, we focus on Him. Christ will return when He is ready, and we must in turn be ready. So let's dive into and turn our attention to this incredible vision. But before we do, guys, I want us to stop and pray. John is about to describe something that is overwhelmingly amazing. And there's no words, which you'll see in a minute, that can describe what we're about to see. But I pray that we will step into the presence of the Father. Would you bow with me? Father, we need your grace in this moment. I'm asking you to give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we may know you better. And what we're wanting to know today, Father, is what it feels like to step into your presence. Father, we know you're here. There's nowhere that you are not. We are always in your presence, but Lord, your manifest presence is different. That's where you make yourself known. When we step into heaven, Father, when we do what John was privileged to experience, our lives are going to forever be altered in ways we can't even begin to understand. But could you just give us a little bit of that understanding today? Turn our hearts and our minds to you in this moment. Block out all the thoughts, all the distractions. In your name we pray. And Eagle Heights said, amen. All right, notice what's happening here. Automatically, when he opens up, notice what John focuses upon. He starts, look what he says in verse 2, and I once was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven. He starts talking about the glory of this throne. Now, it's important that you understand why he's focusing on on the throne because the throne symbolizes God's sovereignty and it's revealing what he's about to do. It's showing what God is about to accomplish. Now, what is he about to do? He's about to establish his kingdom. Now, we're going to talk a lot about the kingdom of God. Let me put it in a nutshell for you here. The kingdom of God is God's rule and his reign over his entire creation. God created it, God sustains it, God owns it, and His creation responds appropriately. Now, when God created in the beginning, that's exactly how He did it. But there was one problem. God had put in the garden a tree of good and evil. That was a choice. See, He wanted a love relationship with man, but man has to choose that. So that tree was a choice. Now, in that choice, man could either love God or disobey God. And in man's rebellion, man wanted to escape God's sovereign rule, that he's in control, he's in charge. Man wanted to sit on his own throne. Man wanted to be like God. And man thought through the deception of Satan that we could escape God's sovereignty, that we could escape God's sovereign rule. But when man sinned, when they disobeyed God, they realized something quickly. They could not escape God's sovereignty. It changed the relationship to now they're under his condemnation. Meaning because I am a sinner, because I violated the king's standard, because I've broken his laws, I'm now automatically condemned for my sin. And that's a state every single person exists in to this point. We are in disagreement, disobedience, rebellion against the sovereign king. We're separated from him. So he is coming to do what? Establish his kingdom to take what was broken here, and he's going to finalize it here. That which entered into our world, the sin that came into this world is going to be dealt with because in his new kingdom, there will be no sin. There is no sin. So all of you out there right now who are longing for peace, you're longing for rest, You can only find it in this kingdom, his kingdom. 
He's the only one who can provide it. Why? Because what has taken that peace is sin. Sin has created chaos. Sin has created disorder. Sin has created doubt. Sin has created shame. Everything that robs us of peace has to be removed, and it comes from sin. You know, guys, we're in an election cycle. If you haven't figured that out, congratulations, you're the lucky one. But have you noticed what really elections are? Elections are taking all the problems we face in our culture and blaming the last guy in office because he wasn't able to fix it. That's what it's been since I've been a kid. Now, here's what I want you to understand. So many of us get obsessed with politics. Do you know what I've realized after being through multiple election cycles? No party, Republican, Democrat, Independent, pick another party, I don't care, Green Party, none of them can solve society's problems. Do you know why? Because society's problems are rooted in sin. And until sin is eliminated, those things can't go away. So if you're counting on Trump or Biden or someone else to bring peace to our nation, guess what? They cannot do it. Why? Because no political party addresses the real problem, which is sin. That's what's causing the lack of peace. Some of you are sitting here going, Brad, I want justice. You know what? In his kingdom, that is exactly what is going to take place. Some of you are going, Brad, I need mercy. Well, guess what? We just sing about it. It is in his kingdom that not only will you taste mercy, you will swim in it for eternity. Christy sat down and he goes, is the mercy seat gone when we go to heaven? And I go, no, because he is mercy. Wherever he is, that is where mercy is. In that moment, we need mercy now more than ever. The graciousness of God to rescue us from what we are. But in eternity, guess what we will be? We will no longer be sinners. We will be sinless. Our sin nature is gone. And we can enjoy the mercy, not rescuing us from our sin, but celebrating the fact that we're no longer trapped in it. We're going to have more opportunity and mercy than we've ever imagined. But in his kingdom... As his kingdom comes, he will establish all of this. So what is the tribulation? Why? Because God is giving man one last chance. People are getting one last chance. God in his sovereignty, when he brings judgment, he always provides a season of mercy to give man an opportunity. One last chance. And the tribulation is man's last chance. And he's reduced it down to two choices. There's not 30,000 religions now. There's just two choices. The risen Lord or the false Christ who rises in the midst of this. But in this situation, the risen Lord is going to display something incredible. He is displaying that he is the only one who truly controls creation. He has power over it and creation is doing his bidding. And you will see through these judgments, he's showing mankind, this is my absolute hatred of sin, and you're getting a glimpse of how I'm going to punish it. And in tribulation, all objections against God, all of them are answered. You know, when people sit back and say, if God would just show up, I'd believe in him. If God is such a loving God, why does he deal with justice? If God is such a loving God, why does bad things happen? Well, guess what? We don't get to control God. We don't get to say, God, move. God has already established the time where those questions are going to be answered, and it's in the tribulation. He is going to show up. He's going to reveal himself. He's going to deal with injustice. Every single accusation against God will be eliminated in this time frame. Everything that people think they need to believe will happen, but Scripture tells us they refuse to believe. What's going to be revealed is that man's heart is ultimately sinful and rebellion against his sovereignty, and they will not be convinced. Even after God shows everything they've asked to be shown, they will not believe. They refuse to say yes. They refuse to believe. But then we see something else. Go back to the text. We see the throne, and we see that there's one sitting on the throne. Now I want you to see something. He is not resting. He's reigning. We don't see God resting until we are seated with Christ at the end of Revelation. The rest begins there. It begins when we are rewarded. But because he's reigning, we see that nothing is escaping his his oversight. 
This entire event is under his control. It has a purpose. It has a beginning and a point of ending. All of it exists for a reason. And the fact that he is in charge of it all can bring incredible comfort to his children. Because everything that is about to happen is part of this plan. But that throne, that throne is essential. Because all of the creation is appraised by that throne. See, all of creation must answer the question, and it's a simple question. Have you willingly submitted to the one who has all sovereignty? Because every single person will stand before that throne. Every single person who's tried to escape his sovereignty must realize you cannot escape his sovereignty. He is in absolute control and there's nothing we can do about that. We are either in relationship with him or we are in rebellion against him. And every single person will be appraised on if they chose to submit or if they chose to say no. The throne is essential in all of creation because it began with a throne and it's going to end with one. Showing that God has always been sovereign. But then John steps into something incredible. He begins to give an accurate description of an indescribable person. Uh, John is doing an incredible job. Look what he says here. Verse 3, the one who sat there had an appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircling the throne. Now just one verse, he's describing God. But in that, understand God is indescribable. Matter of fact, he starts out by using gemstones and he's showing us something about God, that God is light, or God is spirit, sorry. God is spirit, I jumped ahead there. Because it's impossible to describe God. It's impossible to give him because there are no words that can fully capture, even communicate his essence. So he's using what? Gemstones, look what the gemstones are. Jasper and Ruby. Now understand what a jasper stone is. A jasper stone is like a diamond. That's the closest thing we have. Now the picture here is this. What happens if you're to take a diamond and you're to hold it up into sunlight? What happens? On the other side of that diamond, the light is refracted into the light spectrum, meaning every single possible combination of light can be expressed through that. Now stop. I want you to step into this imagery. Here's what John is saying. As I looked into him and saw the Spirit of God, what I saw was every single solitary possible light combination that has ever existed or will ever exist is being refracted throughout the throne room. Can you even begin to imagine the beauty of that? That there's not a light shining through God, that he is the light and it's radiating from him. It is... Pouring forth, overwhelming all of creation, the radiant glory of God expressing itself in the most beautiful color combinations that we cannot even begin to understand. But then the image changes a little bit. It becomes ruby red. It's a Sardis stone. It represented the color of what? God's wrath. So in this, John is seeing a shade of red. Noticing that the image, this beautiful vision is starting to change as we're seeing a ruby red image begin to glow through Christ, which we know is getting ready to represent what he's about to do, which is his wrath that is about to be poured out upon the earth. But this changes the vision from one of just peace to one of judgment. But for us as believers, we know we're not going to be in that judgment. We're not going to face his wrath. He's already promised that. So this creates an excitement for us. Now, guys, I need you to step into this for a second. Do you realize we serve a God we've never seen? Only a handful of people have seen him throughout creation. A handful. Most of us have never, ever fully seen God. But when we go to heaven for the first time, we'll see him. Now, I need you to understand something. It is only in eternity, in his throne room, in his presence that we will begin to understand who God truly is. Oh, we can define it on this side. We have enough to know Him. We know He's real. We know He's guiding us. We see His attributes. 
But on this side of eternity, we're going to step into those attributes and we're going to feel them for the first time. Do you understand what heaven is? We fully cannot understand God until we're experiencing Him. And we will still then not fully understand Him. But we'll have a deeper understanding than we have ever imagined. Let me give you an example. Isaiah. Isaiah knew God was holy. He knew God was a holy. But when he stepped into his presence in the temple... The holiness of God drove him to his knees. And what did he say? I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm among a people of unclean lips. There's something that happens in the presence of God that cannot happen here. We will taste his essence in ways we can't even begin to imagine. And we'll taste it without a sin nature, meaning we can fully enjoy every bit of it. There'll be no condemnation. There'll be no wrath. There'll be no shame. There'll be no guilt. Why? Because we're under the blood of the Lamb. And we're welcome into His presence because the man sitting on that throne is our Father. And we are welcome in His presence. We are awaiting something. There's something awaiting us as we enter into eternity that has never been experienced to this point. But God isn't just spirit. God is light. Matter of fact, in his essence, throughout all the Bible, he's described as light. Matter of fact, when John wrote about this experience, here's what he wrote. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. There in him there is no darkness at all all. Matter of fact, what he's telling you is this. The next verse says, if you claim to walk in the light in relationship with God, but then you're living in darkness, you're a liar and the truth's not in you. Why? Because God can't have darkness in his presence. If you're a lifestyle of darkness, if you're practicing darkness, if this is something that you're trying to pretend and hide and, and convince everybody you're genuine, and then you're claiming to have this close relationship with God, but privately you know that's not who you are. Notice what he's saying. You're not walking with God because he's light and darkness and light do not go together because light drives out darkness. Matter of fact, the second person who saw God besides John in, in heaven was Paul. And Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, look what he said, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. That is on this side of eternity. He lives in an unapproachable light. We have a God that is so unique and so separate from the world that in his presence we will see everything in a completely and totally new light. But that leads to the last one, which is God is creator. God is creator. Notice what's surrounding the throne in verse 4. There were, or in the end of verse 3. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Now, understand what this is an allusion to. It's going back to the, the flood. Remember what took place in the flood? Man had become so wicked. Mankind had become some, so evil that God said, I'm going to have to destroy them or they're going to destroy everything. But he didn't just immediately do that. In mercy, in mercy, he let Moses preach. Excuse me, Moses wasn't there. Noah preach. Moses would come later. Or come earlier. No, it would be after that. Moses is after Genesis 6. I know my history. It's just confused in my head right now. That's okay. In chapter 6, before the flood came, Noah preached 120 years. No one believed. What is that 120 years? The mercy of God. Believe. God's getting ready to send judgment. God's getting ready to send judgment. Please, please, please repent. And when man did not, God sent judgment and he destroyed the earth. But when the flood subsided and they came out, God did something. God made a covenant with man. Matter of fact, it says he made a covenant with all the flesh, which is going to be important next week in understanding the angels, the four living creatures, the crazy angels that Mike described. This is going to help us understand it. What was that covenant? He will no longer destroy the earth ever again by flood. And what did he put in the sky? A rainbow. Now notice something here. In heaven surrounding the throne is a rainbow. God's covenant. But we see God also described with these gemstones. When you put the two together, notice what's happening. It is a covenant promise that in His 
judgment, there will be mercy. And at the end of this, he's going to recreate a new kingdom. Why? Because those stones we see, along with many others, are all over the new creation in the new heaven and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. Those are the building blocks of what he's going to do in the future. So when we see this, God is looking at his children and said, do not be afraid. Do not fear this event. Because in the end, I'm creating something so incredible and I'm giving you my word and it surrounds me. The covenant is above me at all times to remind you and to remind all of us, God will complete his work. And in his judgment, he will end with mercy. God is spirit, God is light, and God is creator. But then we see something crazy in verse 4. 24 thrones with 24 elders. There are 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white, had crowns of gold on their head. We see these are elders around the throne. Now, the biggest question people have asked is the identity of the elders. We want to know who they are. Well, we know they're not angels. How do we know that? Angels are never referred to as elders anywhere in Scripture. Angels are never wearing white garments, especially in Revelation. That's the reward, or that's the image that comes from believing in the blood of Christ, and we're washed clean by His blood. We see that throughout that, and that makes us white as snow. That's something that the believer wears, and the crowns are never worn by angels. Those are rewards given to the believer. So we know they're not angels. So that means they have to be human beings. But guess what, guys? There are 13 different views that I can find about who these people are. There's volumes written about who these people are. I've seen one that said, and this is the most popular one, that it's 12 Old Testament patriarchs and the 12 apostles of the New Testament. Others say it's 12 saints from the Old Testament, 12 saints from the New Testament. Others say these are just, these are just believers who are taking rotational turns serving the Lord. Here's what we know. We don't know. We don't. And here's what I want you to understand, and it doesn't matter. Who they are is irrelevant. It's what they are doing that matters. Because the elders are reigning with Christ. That's what they are doing. Everything about heaven is so focused on God. And it's focused on Jesus. Who are the worship leaders? Who are the elders? Worship leaders. The four angels are going to be the song leader, for lack of a better word. They're the ones that are standing and they're leading eternity and all of heaven in song. And notice what the elders do. They respond to that song. We're going to see them fall on their face. We're going to see them take their crowns and lay it at their feet. We're going to see them bow down and we begin to see them scream, worthy is the Lord. Worthy is the Lord. They are leading heaven in responding to the holiness of God. And how are they doing that? By how they personally respond to the holiness of God. By falling on their face and saying, He is so worthy, there's none like Him. We'll get into that next week. But their job is to do one thing, focus people on God. Matter of fact, next week or in two weeks, John, John becomes, begins to weep in chapter 5, and one of the elders comes to him and said, Hush it up, boy. You need to look at the Lamb who's worthy. Because he didn't think there was anybody worthy to complete God's plan. Their job is one, to focus everyone upon the king. But then this vision changes dramatically. Verse 5, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. This beautiful scene is immediately altered. Because when do we see thunder and lightning? A storm's approaching. There's a storm coming. A storm of judgment this world has never seen before. The wrath of God is about to be unloaded onto the earth. I'll never forget, it was 1990, I was working at First Moore as a junior high youth pastor. I was heavily involved in Young Life at Moore High School. Uh, that's where I sp- Young Life was, was really the, the, one of the primary ways we were getting into the school. And I, got, I was allowed to go to Young Life Ranch in Colorado. And one of the things we did that, that week was we got to hike to the Continental Divide, which is the division in the Rocky Mountains that begins at the north uh, of the U.S. border and ends at the southern end of the U.S. border. You can actually go down the entire Continental Divide. It's a giant valley that you can walk through, and it'll take you from, from the north to the south to the south to the north. It took us all morning to get up there. We had several hundred kids. We're getting them up this mountain. We got to the top of the mountain. Now, leading us were five professional hikers, 
One of them had on a pack that looked like a portable ambulance. And I had no idea why. We had no more sat down to eat our lunches. And lightning started striking the mountain we were on. I need you to understand something. If you've never been near a lightning strike, it is the most terrifying thing I've ever been through. Guys, I need you to understand something. I've rappelled off faces that are 200 feet tall. I've done, I bungee jumped. I've done everything but parachute out of a plane because Christy won't let me do that. That's, I've done it all. But I've never been more terrified than in that moment. The ground shook. Our hair stood on end. I had hair. (laughs) I wasn't even near it. Static electricity was everywhere. But there was a student 150 to 100 yards from that lightning strike and he fell down as if he was dead. I realized while that man was carrying that pack, they got on that boy and they started working and they ordered all of us down and they said, as fast as you can. We had to run from the presence of that lightning. They were so afraid another one would happen. The boy ended up living, but he, he suffered some significant damage. But in the presence of that lightning... We were reduced to what we were. Humanity who could not prevent what was taking place. The lightning of God's judgment is going to strike. And His sovereignty will be revealed. No one can stop it. Creation obeys Him. Your only option is to flee. So before that event happens, maybe you should settle the issue of the throne. Because that's what this entire focus in chapter 4 on is His sovereignty. Every single person, including you and me, will be appraised on our response to this throne. Have you submitted to it? Of our, you rejected it and rebelled. If you rejected and rebelled, you're going to enter into a time of judgment where the full wrath of the living God will be poured out upon you. Why? Because He gave you every opportunity at mercy, every opportunity at peace, every opportunity to bow before He who is in control, and you refused. You shook your face, fist in His face, said, I'll do what I want, thinking that you could escape. You don't escape the sovereign. He's in charge. He owns it all. This is His. He created us. He sustains us. He owns us. So this morning, the only proper response to this king is submission. Now, he's unlike any other king. He's not a He's not a dictator that demands it. Remember the tree in the garden I pointed out at the beginning? He gave us a choice, but he was very clear in the beginning. The choice is simple. You can say yes, or you can say no. You say, Brad, that's not a choice. If I'm going to die, and go to hell. It absolutely is, because we have a creator who knows absolutely what's best for us. Just like we know with our children, we don't let them play with fire, because we know what's best for them. He doesn't let us run to sin because He knows what's best for us. He knows all. We do not. This idea that I can live my life and I can find purpose and meaning beyond it, Him, is a lie. Because sin steals, it kills, and it destroys. It doesn't build. It robs. So here's a loving sovereign who knows what it does, and He's giving you a choice. Submit And surrender and follow a loving God who paid the price for our sin, made a way for us to connect to Him through the cross. He came, He died, He paid the debt we owe. So we could say yes and bow. Or say, I'll do what I want and I don't care what you do. It is a scary thing to to land in the hands of a living God. Especially if you're shaking your fist at that living God. But this morning, all you have to do is surrender. How? Admit you're a sinner. What does that mean? That over here, everything that happened in this garden is a result of man's sinful heart. 
that we are naturally rebellious at our nature. We don't choose Him. We choose away from Him every time. Admit that's true about yourself. Admit you deserve the punishment. That punishment is death. But believe in what? That Jesus has already paid that debt price for you. You don't have to pay it. You just have to come and say, I believe that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection counts for me. And then what do I do? You confess Him to be Savior and Lord. You submit. If that's you this morning and that's what God's leading you to do, I want you to bow your head with me and pray right now. Just repeat what I just said, sir. Do Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. Just say it to him. I admit it. I deserve death. You're right. I'm wrong. Now, Jesus, I choose to believe in you. I choose to believe in you. I believe that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection pays for my sin debt. I believe you're the only way to heaven. Now, Lord, I'm confessing something to you. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, take a moment and say thank you. Tell him how much you appreciate him, how much you love him. Thank you that we have a God who loves us enough to not destroy us in the face of our rebellion, but rescues us through the cross. What a merciful God. When we deserved death, when we were His enemy, He rescued us. What an amazing God. Thank Him. Now, as we end our time of invitation here, I want us to begin to pray, to begin to pray for, for VBS this week. You know our evangelism goals, but let's pray. Pray with me. Father, we have so many goals we've set this week that we know only you can fulfill. Number one is that the gospel will go home with the children that come. That the gospel will go home with the children that come. They won't just hear the gospel, they'll take it home with them. and They'll remember it from this point forward. God, we pray for the testimonies that will be shared. For the workers who are developing their testimony this week. For the testimonies that are being shared throughout the week at different stations, at different times, on the stage, I pray that those testimonies will be evidence of your grace in the life of these, of these students. And then the gospel will begin to pair with that testimony and show that you can change any life. Lord, I pray that as we share the testimony at different times during this week, at different stations, that students and kids will believe. Father, we can't make anyone say yes to you. Only you can draw. Only you can save. Only you can provide faith. And we're asking you to do your part and give us the strength to do ours. And finally, Father, as we do family night, give us grace and glory as we share the gospel to parents in testimony form. Let us see people saved. Father, our goal this week is to glorify you, to share the gospel to let the gospel do its work, to educate and train our children, and to celebrate those who become believers in you. Thank you, Jesus. In your precious name we pray. And God's people said, Amen.